In the book of Acts, it says that after the crucifixion, Jesus Christ rose from the grave and that he presented himself to all of his apostles, to all of his followers. And it says that on many occasion, he made himself known and gave many proofs, proofs that he was alive. All throughout our world, people are looking for proof. We want proof that Jesus Christ lived and that Jesus rose from the grave. And in Luke, it says that he gave proofs that he was alive. In 1 Corinthians, it talks about one of these resurrection moments, one of these moments of proof. When Jesus appeared to over 500 people at one moment, 500, not cumulative, but in one moment, 500 people are witnessing and, and seeing Jesus right there in front of them. Now, if, if people were excited to see Jesus when they were in little small crowds, the Bible says that when a small crowd, Jesus appeared to them in an upper room and, and it says they were overflowing with joy and amazement. If that happened with just a small crowd, can you imagine what it was like when 500 people were together and all of them seeing, many of them for the very, very first time, Jesus Christ was alive and risen. They were able to come up and touch him and look at him and, and hug him. The jubilation, the, the, the excitement of that many people, when, when a lot of people finally get to know Jesus Christ and when a lot of people give their lives to him and believe there is something that is exciting that breaks out when a lot of people are there 500 and we don't know Matthew Mark Luke and John doesn't tell us exactly which resurrection moment that 500 people saw Jesus and so we're left to read all of the resurrection accounts and and we say ah we think this is the one where that 500 people came and saw Jesus at one moment. And in Luke 24, it says that, that, that people came out of a town called Bethany, and this is the last resurrection appearance that Jesus gave right before he ascended into heaven. It says that he met with all of these people right outside of Bethany on the Mount of Olives. And in that place, he said to them and started to bless them and then he was taken up into heaven right after he blessed all of the people. The Mount of Olives. And, and the Bible says that when Jesus had led everyone outside of Bethany to the Mount of Olives, Jesus lifted up his hands and he blessed them. This is the last Easter resurrection moment. And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven and caught up in the clouds, and they all broke out in worship and great joy. And then they went back down into their Jerusalem, worshiping and praising God. And as I read all of the resurrection accounts, the one that I was stuck on is this one at, at the Mount of Olives. And I think that it's exciting for us right now in a unique way that we will have never experienced before, and here's why. I read the text, and I studied it and studied it, but, but it wasn't until I looked at a map, Google Maps, of the Mount of Olives. And I looked at it today, and I saw where the Mount of Olives overlooked Jerusalem. And I looked at it, and I went all the way around looking at it, and I thought, my goodness, that looks a lot like our hill. It looks like where we are right now. And, and I realized that the Mount of Olives, where those 500 people witnessed the resurrected Jesus Christ and encountered him and, and worshiped him, is really very similar, very similar to where you are sitting right now. I mean, it was a large hill overlooking Jerusalem, and we're in a large hill overlooking Marble Falls and the Highland Lakes area. The land around Jerusalem and around it was similar to our land here. The trees were similar. The bushes were similar. The, the, the way that it kind of looks, the rocky soil was similar. Everything that, that, that they were looking at when they were at the Mount of Olives with the resurrected Jesus really is very similar to this particular spot. And I believe that it's so exciting. If if you cannot go 
to the Holy Land in worship on the Mount of Olives, this is the second best place in the whole country. It's very, very unique. You are in a unique place. And because of that, and because of the way this looks and the way this feels, I believe that God did not bring us here today on Easter Sunday outside. We weren't going to meet outside. We, COVID-19 kind of sent us out. We weren't going to do it. We were also going to move back in just a few minutes ago when the weather was coming. I mean, we had our finger on the send button. We were going to go in. But God wanted us to be on our Mount of Olives in this particular spot that looks so much like it did for all of Jesus' followers in that moment and in that time when they had their Easter moment and witnessed the resurrected Jesus. God ordained this. He anointed this because it is by no accident that He wanted every one of you to be right here sitting down looking at this very place. He wanted you to sit there. And He wanted to talk to you and He wanted to appear to you on our Mount of Olives together just as He did those people during that time. And if all of you will open your hearts and open your minds, today's Easter will take you to the mountaintop with Jesus Christ just like it did all of those original followers. Luke goes and in, in, in sequential order, he describes these moments where Jesus' followers met him on the Mount of Olives. And they had these very incredible encounters with the Lord. And, and, and we're going to trace those and we're going to pretend like it was us. And this is our Mount of Olives. And we're going to join Jesus in all of these moments. And we're going to allow our hearts to be transformed just like their hearts were transformed in those moments. And so the first encounter on the Mount of Olives that we're going to have with Jesus is, is talked about in Luke 19, 28, when Jesus comes out of a town called Bethany and he is going down into Jerusalem on what we call the triumphal entry in Palm Sunday. And let me tell you about the geography so you can really see, man, it, it, it is similar. Here is how close Bethany was to to us here and how close it was to Jerusalem. If Marble Falls was Jerusalem and this hill is the Mount of Olives, it really is a distance almost identical. And if you go down off the back of this hill and you go down into the apartments of Panther Hollow, that is almost identical to where Bethany was. And what was happening is that people were coming out of the town, the little village of Bethany, and all of the people knew each other. It's a little village. Many of you come from a small, small town. Y'all know what it's like. Everybody knows everybody. If you get in trouble, everybody knows. That's Bethany. And many of you are coming out of Bethany and you're related to each other. You know each other. You're coming out of Bethany with Jesus Christ. He is going down into Jerusalem to be crucified. Many people from Jerusalem, and that's some of you, you're coming up out of Jerusalem and we're all meeting here on the Mount of Olives. And it's an exciting moment. Jesus had just sent Peter and John to go and get to him a, a, a young donkey and bring it up. And Jesus gets on the donkey maybe right over there about where the beginning of our property is and he starts riding. And here's everybody else coming out of Jerusalem meeting the people out of Bethany. So some of you are from Bethany from um, uh, the, the, the apartments down at Panther Hollow here. The others of you are from Jerusalem. And so Bethany and Jerusalem, we're all going to meet right here on the Mount of Olives in this triumphal entry moment with Jesus Christ. And here is something exciting. Many of you know each other just like they did. Some of the people were related to each other. And because of that, there were miracles that Jesus had performed and you were there. You, you witnessed them. You've been with walking with Jesus for three years. And so when he healed that little girl, when he healed that man, when he healed that grandparent, that was y'all. That was y'all. Pretend like that, that. That's you guys. 
And when you look around this crowd and we're putting Jesus up onto the donkey and excited about him, you look around and you see, man, there's the, there's the man that, that Jesus healed. He's my uncle. And there's my friend over here and he works over at the tire shop and Jesus healed him of leprosy. And y'all look around and that's what you're seeing and that is adding to the excitement. Because we look around this very Mount of Olives moment and you see people that you know and who were healed by Jesus. One of the greatest miracles that Jesus did just three days before the Mount of Olives triumphal entry was he brought a man named Lazarus back from the dead. Lazarus was from Panther Hollow. He comes out of, of that Bethany, that Panther Hollow with Mary and Martha. And here, they're there with all of the people, and they're excited about that. Lazarus was a very, very popular man, and he had just died, and Jesus brought him back to life. So if we were going to make this very, very real, and we were going to understand what it was like to be with Jesus in that moment, then one of you guys has to be the popular Lazarus. Let's choose Coach Larry Berkman. What do you say? <laughs> Coach Berkman is sitting over here. Wave to us, Coach. There he is. He's our Lazarus for a moment, and we know him. Now, I want you to picture it. As much as we love Coach, if we had lost him, if we had lost him and we were grieving that, and it was very, very sad, and Jesus Christ showed up, and he brought Coach Berkman back to us. And now he is here, and all of us around him are looking at him thinking, that dude was just dead, and he is alive because of Jesus. Y'all, wouldn't we be rejoicing on the Mount of Olives? And let's say that we looked around and we saw this little girl and that little boy and that grandparent. We're getting more and more excited all around you are people that you actually know, and that person is alive and that person is healed today. And it's so exciting, it's so exciting to us that when Jesus is going down, that, 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 that we're overwhelmed by all of it. And one of you sees uh, Coach Berkman and you're so excited about what Jesus has done. One of you, let's say that it's Rick O'Connor and he just cries out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And his best buddy, Mark Few, jumps in and he starts saying it with him. This is y'all. And you're excited about it. And all of you start saying it together. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King. And we're all so excited about it that Calvin Richard and Courtney Richard get their kids and they see a little Seiko palm over there. And they run over and they cut it down. And they come and they start giving their palm branches to their kids and others. And we all start saying it together. Hosanna, blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. We're excited about it. And then Lamar Tudor has an idea. And he goes over and here's Jesus on his donkey and Lamar takes his jacket off. And he says, that donkey where Jesus is walking doesn't need to be walking on this ground. I'm going to put my own coat down for him. And he puts it down because Jesus healed his wife, Ginger. And he puts it down. And all of us know these stories because we know each other. That's the way that it was for them. It wasn't a bunch of strangers coming to a concert. It was a family. These were people who knew and knew their stories and they were excited about all of it. And the Bible says that Jesus came as a king, but he came as a king in peace. He came riding on a young donkey, not on a war horse, but on a donkey. And we didn't know that Jesus was riding down into Jerusalem to take his throne, but the throne would be the cross. We didn't know, but he did and he continued to ride anyway. And then we move on, and there's another moment here on the Mount of Olives. And we can't forget it. A few verses later, Luke 19, 48, right after we're all excited, there comes a moment where Jesus just stops his donkey. Whoa! Before he gets down off of the hill, maybe somewhere over here near this tower, we're all here and we're with Jesus, but he stops. And all of us kind of in the back, we're, we're, we're thinking, why did we stop? Troy Sims yells out, why are we stopping? And it's because Jesus just starts to look, and he's looking down over our Jerusalem, our Marble Falls, and he just stares for an awfully long time. 
and he just looks at it, and we wonder, what, what is he looking at? And we go over to him, and we see that he's beginning to cry. He's beginning to weep. The only, Jesus only wept in the Bible, we, we read on two occasions, and one of them, when he was up on the Mount of Olives, and he's overlooking a town very similar to this, and he looks down at all of them, and the people who are closest to Jesus, here's what he says. He says, if you, Jerusalem... And for us, it would be Marble Falls. And for if you had only known what would bring you peace. Why peace? He's coming on a donkey, not on a war horse. He's coming in peace. If you had only known what was going to bring you peace on this day, but your eyes didn't even see it. And then he said, oh, how I, I longed, I longed to, to be like a mother hen that gathered all of its chicks and protected them, but you rejected me. And when he's talking about it, he begins to love them. But he's hurt because they've rejected him. But his love propels him to go further and further down into Jerusalem. But his heart was broken for them. As they were up on this mountain and they were looking down, Jesus' heart was broken for all of the people. Our heart breaks for our city too. I'll share with you a personal story. Eleven years ago, I was the pastor at First Baptist Church in Hondo, Texas, west of San Antonio, and I loved it. And my wife loved it, my kids. We loved our church, the First Baptist Church of Hondo. A committee from this church, Marble Falls, showed up to us, and they said, we're needing a pastor and we'd love to talk to you. Would you just come to Marble Falls and pray with us and talk to us? And we came. We met with the committee a couple of times, but there was something that happened in my life when John Berkman brought me to this very spot, actually. None of these buildings were here. He brought me here, and I looked out, and something happened, and my heart broke for the people of this valley this community in the Highland Lakes area. In fact, I was, I was standing absolutely where I'm standing right now. And in, and in a moment, God took my heart from where it was and he placed my heart here. And for all of these years, I've had a longing for all of the people of the Highland Lakes to meet the risen Jesus Christ. I have a longing and a passion for that. I look down at our community, the way that Jesus, and we're looking at, down at it, the way that Jesus looked down at His community. And our heart kind of breaks with Him. When Jesus was going down into Jerusalem and people heard Him talking, some of them got it. Some of them got it and, and they began to hear Him and they thought, yeah, why aren't more people from Jerusalem up here with us? Why don't they see if it were us, it would be like we're going down and when Jesus is over here lamenting, it would be like Richard turns to his wife, Gloria Pickle, and says, I hear what he's saying and I, I think I get it, Gloria, I get it. What, what, why don't more people come up? Why aren't more people sitting where you're sitting, worshiping the king? What, what, what's going on? I look down with all of you at, at our Jerusalem and this is the place that endured the 2018 floods. All of these homes, all of that, they were all flooded, weren't they? And I look down at our community and we endured everything together in 2020. I, I see our school. I see HEB. I love HEB. <laughs> I, 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 see, I see your homes in Meadow Lakes, and I can see all the way to Mormon Mill. I can see it. Jesus stopped, and he looked down at his community, and his heart broke for everybody. And he thought, I'm going to continue riding this donkey down and go to the cross because of all of these people, because I love them. And then all of us go down with Jesus, but then Jesus brings us all back here for a moment of teaching. In Luke 21, another moment on the Mount of Olives, we all come back up and Jesus starts talking to us about the end times. And to all of his apostles, he said to them, and they would have hung on every word, 
Watch out, he said, that you are not deceived. For many people are going to come in my name. And they're going to make you think that they are all about me. And that they are strong Christians. But they are not. Do not follow them. When you hear of, of even wars and, and rumors of wars and uprisings and people are mad about this and people are mad about all of that, don't be frightened, he says. All of these things just are going to happen in this broken world that we're in. Hold on because I'm coming back and you will know. And some of us hear that and, 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 and we're in this crowd on the Mount of Olives and we think, I think we get it, Lord. And some of you start saying, God, is this what you're talking about? Okay, that when things get really, really bad, that we're not supposed to panic? We're not supposed to lose our minds? That we're not supposed to get involved with stupid things? That we're going to serve you wholeheartedly through it and faithfully? Lord, is that, is that it? And he says, yes, that's the end times message. And we say, okay, Lord, and many of us go back into Bethany and some go back down into Jerusalem. There is another moment just a few days later in Luke 22 that something else happens here on the Mount of Olives with Jesus' followers. And now this is the hardest moment, one of the hardest in Jesus' entire life. After the Last Supper in Luke 22, Jesus it says, went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. And this time there's not a large crowd. There may be only a few of us. And on reaching the Mount of Olives, it says that Jesus said to them, I want y'all to stay here and I'm going to go over here and I'm going to pray. And I want y'all to pray so that you are not led into temptation. And the Bible says that Jesus went from about here to our prayer tower and then he bent down and, and it, he started to pray. And he said, Father, if there is any other way we can do this, if at all possible, may this cup pass away from me. And at that moment, he is sweating like drops of blood falling from him. If there's any way, Lord, any way, can we do this a different way, God? And then he said, but not my will, but yours be done. And and he gets back up and he comes over to where his apostles are, still on the Mount of Olives. And he said, why are y'all sleeping? I need your help. I need you to pray so that you're not falling into temptation. And then before he even knows, here comes the crowd. And they have come all up from Jerusalem. He could even see them possibly coming up. And now they're there and Judas is leading the, the betrayal party. And they have torches and they have lights and they have clubs and spears and they go over and Judas walks up to Jesus first and he leans in and, and Luke says that Jesus asked him, Judas are you really going to betray me with a kiss? In our beautiful sanctuary we have a stained glass window depicting this moment the betrayal moment the moment at on the Mount of Olives at the little garden that's there to be on the Mount of Olives is not just about the triumphal entry and it's not just about learning how to be faithful in the end times that we're in today. But also being on the Mount of Olives means that we are absolutely helpless. We're helpless. There's nothing we can do when we see our Lord and Savior dragged away. There's nothing we can do. We're, we're in a helpless place in the same way. Sin makes all of us helpless. You are not saved by your works. You are not saved because you do this or you do that. You're saved because Jesus died because of his death and because of who he is. That's what grace is, folks. Grace it comes to us in our helplessness. To be on the Mount of Olives is to experience our helplessness that no matter how good you were at your job, no matter where you live, no matter how much education that you have, you cannot and I cannot earn our way into heaven. We are helpless. And Jesus Christ was taken off of the Mount of Olives and we just are there. And if we had been with all of the apostles, we would have fled like they did. Many of you would have gone back down into Panther Hollow, into our, our Bethany. 
And you would have knocked on all the doors and you would have said, they just arrested him, they just arrested Jesus. And, and the neighbors would have said, well, where did they take him? And you would have said, I don't know. But they were going back down into Jerusalem and you would have woken up all of your neighbors there, your, your, your people related to you, and you all would have come out and you all would have gone down and started to look for him. Some of you may have gone down into Jerusalem looking for Jesus. But by the time that morning came and a lot of people came out of Bethany looking for Jesus and you're looking for him down in Jerusalem and you see a big crowd gathering and you're thinking, what's going on? And people are saying, there is a crucifixion today. And you get there out of Bethany looking for Jesus just in time to see Jesus carrying his own cross. And you think, how in the world did this happen? And he passes by each one of you, all of you who are here cheering for him during the triumphal entry. He passes by you and you look at him and you say, Jesus, ha, what's going on? And, and you're thinking maybe some, something can save him. What, what's happening? You're as confused as you have ever been. And you're helpless. And they take him and they put him on the cross. And you, many of you from Bethany and Jerusalem, you see Jesus die. And then you have to make your way back home. And, and you know the direction you would have gone? Right through here. Right where you're sitting. If Jesus had been crucified down in Marble Falls and all of you lived around Bethany or up north of Bethany in Galilee, all of you would have left that moment and you would have come back through this very place. And you know what you would have done? As you walked, you would have noticed all of the places where we celebrated. You would have looked over at a palm tree and you would have said, look, that's the palm tree that I cut all of the palm branches down. And you would have looked and you said, man, there was where Lamar Tudor laid down his coat and all the rest of us did as well. Look, there's where, there's where we rejoiced. I remember all of it. And all the way back home, you would have looked at all of these places and, and your mind would have been filled with the memories of what the Mount of Olives was, but you, didn't, you don't know what to do with those memories anymore. This was on the way back. And it would have been incredibly sad. And you would have been confused about your life, confused about the world. You would have been very angry. Yes, but there's nothing you can do. Helpless, and you would have felt lifeless, traumatized. Many of you would have been traumatized after seeing such an insanely violent, violent thing in the Mount of Olives that had brought so much hope, now was just an empty kind of place. And you endure the silence here on the Mount of Olives in that moment. But then, out of our silence, Sunday morning comes. Sunday morning happens and the word starts to spread fast. People are knocking on doors down in the villages and people are coming and talking to you about it. And what they're saying is that some of our very people, some of our, our women that we know and love and trust, they went to the tomb this morning and our own ladies have come, our mothers and aunts, some of them, they were just down there and they said that the tomb is empty. They said that Jesus has appeared to them. And we're saying, well, who, who are they? Who were down there? And they say, well, Jill McCurdy was down there. Tammy Weber was down there. Leslie Coleman was down there. Uh, they're, 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 they're saying, Linda Mills was down there. These are our most trusted women. And we think, you know what? The, well, what if it's true? These ladies are trustworthy. They, have, they wouldn't make up anything like this and we begin to believe and get hope and then more and more of you come and you say, I saw him too. I was just walking to burn it on the road to, to Emmaus. I was walking over here and he just appeared to me walking and you come running back and you, you, you start telling everybody, man, he appeared to me too. Matt Cochran says, I was there. And we say, really? And we says, yes. And we all start to hear the stories. And y'all, there's hope being reborn among us. And do you know 
where Jesus chooses to make his very last resurrection appearance? Right here. The Mount of Olives. Luke 24 says that he leads everybody out of Bethany and he comes to that place and right there, 500 or so people show up and they witness his resurrected body and for all of them, that was Easter. That was Easter for them. And they're blown away by it. They're blo- they can't quit looking at Jesus. They can't. They, they think, that guy was dead. I mean, very dead. Very dead. And look at him. You, you could go up. He just talked to me. He just hugged me. He's alive. And they just couldn't. It, they, they can't quit looking at him. It's like this. When, when Megan and I brought our new, newborn babies home, Hannah and Tess, when they were babies, they were in that little crib, and I couldn't quit staring. I couldn't. I couldn't quit looking at them. I thought, my goodness, that wasn't here. <laughs> just a, just the, 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 where did they come from? Ha, look at this life. And I would just look at them and look at them. There was a life that was right there. There is something that is gloriously fascinating about a newborn. You can't quit looking at them. Grandparents can't quit looking. Parents can't quit looking. They're just so amazing. And I wonder if there was something akin to that feeling when these 500 people were looking at Jesus and Jesus was gloriously fascinating. And they can't quit looking at him. This man was dead for three days and here he stands in front of us. He just hugged me. I just touched him. And at that moment, those 500 people became ever so convinced that Jesus really was the king. And somebody says, do you all remember when a few days ago we were singing and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And we were doing it right here on the Mount of Olives. And now he really was. We were right. He is the king, and somebody says he was and is the king, but he's not the king like I thought. I mean, he's so much bigger, bigger than the king I had imagined. I had only imagined a king of my small politics, a king of Israel alone. But Jesus is king of everything. All of history, the whole world, he is king of everything. And he is king, y'all over so much more than every little thing in our world as well. Other people in that crowd were immediately compelled to share the good news with others, but every one of them who saw Jesus were deeply and radically changed by the resurrection. And then all of you are here, hundreds of them, And Jesus begins to do something. This is the very last thing that he did. This is after the Great Commission, after go and make disciples of all of these people. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Surely I'll be with you to the very end of the... After all of that, the last, last, last thing Jesus ever did, there on the Mount of Olives with those 500 people, it says that he blessed. I bless you and I bless you. And I bless you, and I bless you. Maybe it was Aaron's blessing. He would get his hands and he'd come and he would touch all of you, touch your head. And he would say, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Come here, come here. Put his hands on you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and you and you. May the Lord bless all of you. And the Bible says that in the middle of all of that blessing that Jesus began to lift right up into a cloudy day just like today. A cloudy day. And all that we had been through, and he blesses and we see him lifting right off of a ground and going up and we all begin to cheer, don't we? We all begin to cheer for our Lord as he goes up. And, and, and the last thing, as we're cheering, the last thing that he yells down at all of those people, I 
love you. And he's gone. But our cheering doesn't stop. We start cheering and, and, and we cheer and cheer and then he's vanished. But we can't help but keep cheering. And we keep cheering and we have been cheering for our risen Lord ever since. We're continuing to cheer him on. That was Easter for those 500 people. And today, that is our Easter too. Do you believe that God wants you to have a Mount of Olives experience? I do. And would all of you say, I do? Why is it appropriate to respond to it with joy and, and commitment? Because the Lord defeated sin and He defeated death. And there was nothing else that could have. Some statistics say that almost 4% of everybody who had gotten COVID-19 had died and that the death rate was about 4%. But did you know that the death rate of sin is much greater, that 100% of people born into our world are born into sin, and sin is 100% fatal for everyone. Sin is the virus, the pandemic, that kills our world and kills our souls and sends everybody to hell and death. 100%. And they say that in regard to COVID, some statistics say that the vaccines have a good healing rate, some of them over 90%. But the gospel of Jesus proclaims that the vaccine for sin and, and eternal death is Jesus Christ. And it is 100% effective. Jesus was born into our world and He lived and died. And He brought God here because we couldn't get to God. And He brought Him to all of you. And because He lives, we can face tomorrow. Because He lives, we can go on. People of the Highland Lakes, we can go on. Because our Savior is alive. This is what it's about today. I wonder, I wonder if as we move toward a moment of invitation, would you bow your heads with me? Jesus Christ is alive today. And that fact is the most important thing in the entire world and in all of history. It is the most important thing. And for many of you right now, if you feel that God is tugging on your heart to give your life to Him, teenagers and children and adults, if you feel that God is tugging on your heart, don't waste this moment. Don't be embarrassed about it. Don't hesitate. If God is speaking and you can feel Him, the Jesus that rose from the grave is speaking to your heart and He's saying, give your life to me. Your life is better in my hands than it ever, ever was in your own hands. Give your life to me. If God is pulling at your heart, you can give your life to Him today. Would you be willing to ask Jesus to be your Lord and repent of all of your sins. You can do that by, by praying to Him and to make Jesus your Lord. And if you don't know how to pray that, would you pray this? If God is tugging at your heart, would you pray these words? Would you say, Dear Heavenly Father, I believe the story that I just heard. And it is good news. Would you say, Lord, I cannot save myself. And I want you to be my Lord. Say, I repent of my sins. And I give you my life. And the last part is this. Would you say, I believe that you rose from the grave. Now, all of you who gave your life to Jesus just now, would you, many of you prayed that. If you gave your life to Jesus just now, with everybody else still looking down, 
still looking down, if you gave your life to Jesus, would you just make eye contact with me for a moment? For many of you, you need prayer today. Your heart is heavy, heavy with many things. And as we get ready to have an invitation, there's going to be some people who will pray with you and talk to you about all of it. And so I want to ask that if you need prayer today or if you looked up at me a moment ago, we're going to have a place over here to your right under our resurrection banner in a place where we have a little poems set out. And I want you to come over and share with some of our people, some of our counselors over here. Tell them, I, I gave my life to Jesus today. I gave my life. Go and share it. Or if you need prayer, would you go and do that? But for all of the rest of you, all of you sitting here, when we stand, many people are going to go over there and get prayer, and many are going to confess that they've given their life to Jesus. But what about the rest of us? Would you be willing to get up out of your seat and come to the edge of our Mount of Olives? And would you follow Jesus who wept over His city? And would you pray for the Highland Lakes area? Would you pray for our schools and would you pray for our communities? Would you pray for our businesses? Would you pray for all of the people who need to know King Jesus? Would you pray that you become a better witness for all that Jesus has done? Would you come? Let's all of us go to the edge of the Mount of Olives here and look out over our city and let's all of us pray. Let's pray for our community and pray for our friends. And so I'm going to pray for us. And if you looked up at me, I want you to come right over here and they'll pray for you. I want you to tell them, I gave my life to Jesus. I prayed and I did it. And if you need prayer, find these people and ask them to pray. But y'all, let's all of us pray for our community. Are you ready? Dear Heavenly Father, we bring the, the, the end of our, our Mount of Olives experience to a close in this way by responding to you. Lord, when you ascended into heaven, it says that the people couldn't quit cheering. They were so excited. And I ask you, Father, that you will give that excitement to all of us today. That you will be with us and you will move. And that we too will be changed. Be with us now, Heavenly Father, as we respond to this Easter message. Be with us, Lord, in Jesus Christ's name. That we pray by the power of the risen Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.